All right, I think we're ready to get started. So I'll be moderating the panel. Um, thank you guys for joining. I think that um, the uh, theme that we'd like to explore in this panel is um, dive a little bit deeper into uh, the perspectives of the companies that uh, have uh, emerged in the OpenStack space as uh, um, businesses focused on uh, particular aspects or particular projects in OpenStack. So uh, kind of, uh, you know, the first um, wave of uh, OpenStack battles, so to speak, were uh, around uh, um, OpenStack distributions that go across a variety of projects. But then in parallel, there is a whole bunch of players that emerged uh, with a much more focused strategy. And uh, we have some of the folks on the panel here um, representing some of those companies. Um, and uh, throughout the panel, I wanted to give people the opportunity to ask questions. We'd like to keep it interactive. I'll uh, tee it off with some of the questions, but please feel free to uh, pitch in. Um, and I think that uh, we're ready to get started. So um, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, folks from Tesora for uh, actually putting this panel together and uh, giving me the honor of moderating it. Um, I think we'll just go ahead and start with introductions. And uh, what I'd like you guys to do is uh, just introduce yourself, tell a few things about your company, um, and um, the two, uh, I think, things that I'd like you to hit on is one, uh, talk a little bit about um, your business model. So how is it that you know, you're, you're monetizing whatever you're doing? Is it you're just selling subscription or you have some sort of uh, uh, value added um, licensable product? Mm -hmm. um, the second is um, why are you even you know, doing it in OpenStack um, as opposed to actually doing it outside of a community? So, Joe, right. we'll start with you. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Boris. Uh, so my name is Joe Arnold. Um, I'm the co-founder of, of SwiftStack, and I was the initial CEO there. And uh, so what we do is we focus on OpenStack Swift, and we're the, the, the leading contributors to the OpenStack Swift project, and, um, and what we've done is we've created a product to make it easy to deploy, operate, and scale OpenStack Swift. And what, what OpenStack Swift is, is it's an object storage system, and it's really good for unstructured data, media assets, um, large amounts of storage. That's what, that's what we're focused on. And so to answer your question around with the business model that we have, uh, we're, we're, you know, there's a few, few options when you're an open source company, um, and the path that we chose is to build a commercial product around that. So that does mean that some of our components are proprietary, and the other half of the product is open source. And then for that whole system together, we charge a, a, a subscription license to use the software. Um, and um, what that does is it gives us the ability to have a highly repeatable um, deploy base. So everyone's running exactly the same thing. There isn't a unique snowflake. And that, from our point of view, what that helps us do is um, it keeps the cost low for supporting additional customers as they're coming on board, and then everyone can benefit from, uh, from that. The last thing, which is why open source at all well, versus... No, no, it was, I guess it applies less to you, but might apply more so to others. Yeah, yeah. Um, I happen to know that uh, you guys have started with OpenStack, and you were kind of uh, in there from day one, and Swift is OpenStack, and you are Swift, so it kind of... Uh, Understandable, so you can just skip that part of the All question. All right, <laughs> and I'll pass on. I'll make it easy for you. Okay. I'm Plumgrid, uh, co-founder and CTO at Plumgrid, and uh, uh, what we do is we provide a networking solution for OpenStack clouds. Uh, networking, of course, is something that uh, originally seems very simple. Uh, you deploy your OpenStack in a few nodes, but then you start scaling, going across multiple racks, multiple layer two domains. Then you want security, scalability, load balancing, policies, and so on. Things become complicated, and PlumGrid provides a networking solution that uh, satisfies uh, the requirements of private and public clouds uh, based on OpenStack. We interface through Neutron, uh, through plugin, uh, plugin into Neutron, and uh, the way we started was more as a generic, going back to all these questions, a generic networking layer. The reason was because uh, networking has always been about connecting things together and never being in a kind of a, a silo that you cannot reach to basically legacy environments being bare metals or uh, VMware environments and so on. So we started creating this technology that can go beyond OpenStack, but uh, the focus is on OpenStack. 
Now, the business model is based on licenses on a per node basis, but what we recognize is that OpenStack is kind of a, uh, an environment that gets deployed as a solution. Basically, it has to be the, the OpenStack distribution, the storage, the networking, and then, of course, the, the add-ons in terms of databases and services beyond that. So we tend to be very flexible in the sense that we adjust to our uh, go-to-market partners and OpenStack distribution in terms of how do we uh, provide a compelling solution for the end user to deploy uh, the full capabilities of the network uh, plus the OpenStack environment. Okay, my name is Amrit. I'm founder and CTO of Tesora, and we're the company which is focused on the Trove project. For those of you who don't know what Trove is, it's the database as a service project within OpenStack. And what that gives you is the ability to uh, provision databases, relational and non-relational databases, and manage them through the entire life cycle of the database. So it automates things like taking backups or managing clusters or managing replication, or if you have thousands of database instances, making sure that all of them have the exact same configuration settings at the same time. Um, it's a project which is, it's one of the projects in OpenStack, and it's a consumer of services from uh, Swift and Cinder and as for storage and uh, Nova for compute and so on. Um, why we, uh, how do we license the project was the, or how, what is our business model? You can get Trove from OpenStack.org. You can get it from any number of distribution vendors like uh, Canonical or Red Hat or what have you. And those are typically the same product which you would get from OpenStack.org. There are several things which we've done to improve that, which we offer as part of our enterprise edition. Uh, we also have a community edition, which is literally the same as the OpenStack.org software, only easier packaged and easier for you to use. One of the differences between Trove and the other projects is in order to actually use a database as a service, you need guest images for each of the indi individual databases you want. So some companies use MySQL or Postgres or, or a collection of them. For each database which you want, you need a guest image. We provide guest images which have been built and certified at no charge. You can download them and use them, whether you use our community product or our enterprise product. But we primarily, our business model is through selling our enterprise product, which has support for some databases which are not in OpenStack Trove, like Oracle, and like data stacks and things like that. Um, we didn't choose to go to Trove. We didn't start somewhere, choose to go to OpenStack. Trove was the project for database to service. We've always been working on database to service, and we chose the Trove project. So we came to OpenStack rather than the other way around. So to continue on this theme, then uh, the question is, why did you come to OpenStack? Because from what I know, Tesora has existed before the focus on Trove. Yeah. But then at some point, you decided that, hey, we're going to really yeah. embrace Trove and make that our strategy. What, what drove this decision? So I'll tell you a little bit of the history of the company. So Ken, who's my co-founder, um, and I got together in 2009. My history was working with databases for a long time. and. The thing which I saw as a transition, so if you think about how people consume databases in the old days, you would buy a costly server, you'd buy some costly software, which you'd pay a lot of money to a guy who has a big boat, and then you put the two things together and you'll curse and swear for a long time, and then you get something which looks really ugly and you call it a database. And if you did this 100 times, like big companies do because you have 100 servers, on one of them, you forgot to make one little configuration setting. On another one, you forgot to make one other configuration setting. And that problem would show up usually 2 o'clock in the morning on your wedding anniversary when your phone rings. We realized that people are moving away from that model of purchasing databases to databases as a service, everything as a service. So when we started in 2009, the choice of what platform to go with was difficult. It was either Amazon or EMC Atmos. Amazon didn't seem like the right choice because that was going to be public cloud all the time, and EMC Atmos just didn't seem like the right choice, period. So we'd, we decided we'd build the mechanisms to manage databases at scale and then figure out where the market went, and two years later, OpenStack was the obvious choice. So that's when we switched over to OpenStack. Understood. Thank you. So next question to panelists. So, uh, do your companies contribute code upstream? And uh, if they do, then the question is why? Because naturally not all members um, participating in OpenStack are active contributors, mm -hmm. so you can 
contribute many different ways, not just code. Um, some choose contribute not to contribute. Some choose to contribute very heavily. Um, contributing upstream as an investment, yep. you need to know how to do it. Um, do you do it? And if so, then why? Mm -hmm. All right. So we hugely contribute <laughs> upstream. <laughs> yeah. So we. So what what I think is great about OpenStack is that. You can be a huge contributor to a project, but then everyone else can also be a huge contributor to OpenStack. And and uh, so just in our in our project around OpenStack Swift, um, we you know we always like to claim you know put the flag in the ground. Hey, we're the leading contributor to this project. We have the project technical lead, and that's our those are important things. But then you look at the pie chart, and you guys put that together, and you can actually see it's like. There's other companies you see Intel contributing, HP contributing, you guys are contributing, and and, and that's that that's great because that means you get the diversity and buy-in, and it's not just like a single company if they're coming along and they say, oh, we're going to go open source this thing. Well, is it really open source? It, you know, really, you can only go to them for a solution. But um, I think one of the benefits about OpenStack is that. It's a broad community that creates that level of competition, which I think keeps us all in our game. And, uh, and, but then we all benefit uh, from all, each of our contributions. And what I think is important, though, is that each company, and I think all of us are in the same boat, is we have to differentiate on what we're going to be good at. Mm -hmm. And for us, what that means is we can be really focused on particular use cases, specific industries, and go at right after that. And we can do that better than anyone else. While other people can go and take that same code and go do other things with it, like building public clouds. Um, you know, our, our path is, OK, we're going to drill into the enterprise and do what it takes to uh, land footprint there, for example. Um, but other people can do other things. So I'll take yeah. a crack at that. So at PlumGrid, we had to focus in, in multiple projects. Uh, OpenStack is one of them. Of course, we contribute on the Neutron side, less on the other, uh, on the other parts. But we have to do a little bit more. The thing is that uh, networking starts at the kernel. And the reason is that you have uh, performance motivations while the packet enforcement lookups and things like encapsulations have to start a little bit below uh, where OpenStack lives. So what we did is uh, from the beginning we created a, a new, a very programmable data plane that allows you to extend the capabilities of what Linux traditionally does. And we had to upstream that. So what we did is a couple of years ago we started a project within the Linux kernel community and we managed to upstream in the Linux kernel that. So that was a, a two years, two years and a half effort. And this became kind of a part of the standard default kernels uh, after the 4.x uh, release trains. Mm -hmm. After we had that, though, it was not enough because uh, part of our data plane was uh, uh, more capable than others because we could program it with a set of tools and SDKs that allow you to express what you want. So we went to the Linux Foundation and we created a project called IOISOR, a collaborative project by the Linux Foundation. And uh, different members joined, some of them networking companies like uh, Huawei, Cisco, uh, Silicon companies, Intel, Cavium, Broadcom, and then uh, distributions like SUSE, Canonical, and uh, Barefoot Networks joined too. So what we did is essentially contributing to the community based on the building blocks that are needed to make a, a flexible, extensible, and highly available networking solution. And then, of course, the other component, which is OpenStack, that we are more focused on networking initiatives like Neutron, Courier, and things like that. So we, we have a similar situation as the other two companies here. Uh, we are huge contributors to Trove Upstream. So in the Juno release, Kilo, and in uh, Liberty, we were the number one contributor. In the last release, we were, I don't know, 47% or something like that. Uh, to us, it's important that we contribute upstream because People are using OpenStack fundamentally, well, not fundamentally. One of the reasons is because they don't want vendor lock-in. So if you go to a person who has already pre-selected OpenStack for that reason and you say your only choice is a closed source solution, your chance of winning there is pretty small. Also, a lot of people rather download software. The way in which people buy software these days is different. They download the software, they try it out, and once they like it, then they decide whether they're going to pay for it or not. So yes, we do contribute upstream. But to something which you said, we've gotten into trouble with that because Trove as a project, when it started in ISO, supported seven databases, now supports 12 or 13. And in less than a year, we've added a replication clustering, configuration management, sizing, uh, some initial things to do with scaling and so on. And we decided we have to move really fast. So two 
releases uh, two cycles ago, we were having a serious problem with getting code in with reviews. And one of the things we consciously said was, make reviews smaller and make smaller bytes of code so the reviews are faster. So we've got two companies, HP and Tesora, with a bunch of people working on it. And we're contributing a lot of features, not necessarily enormous numbers of lines of code, but new features. But we break our commits into small chunks. The exact same charts which you talked about show us at 47% and HP at a little over 30-something percent, which means the two of us together are over 80%. So we get dinged on the maturity number which we heard about yesterday. So it's a double-edged sword. So we want to contribute to the open source product. We want to make the open source product successful because we're not going to be successful with our enterprise product unless that product is successful. But in order to play in that, we're getting dinged because of the way in which it's being measured. Understood. So what would happen if you stopped contributing tomorrow to your company? Is it going to be bad for you? If we, if we stop you? contributing to yeah, the upstream the project, to the panel. if we stop contributing yeah. to the upstream yeah. project, yeah. my view it would be bad. Why? Uh, so, <laughs> it w stop contributing to the upstream project. If we were to stop, absolutely yeah. it would be bad because people are going to look at it and say, you're you're effectively creating a closed source or a non-open source project, which that's fundamentally not the way in which people want to play on OpenStack. So uh, yeah, so, so besides half of my uh, engineering team quitting on me, um, yeah, no, I, I think that's it's a huge part of how our <laughs> development culture is being open and collaborative mm -hmm. about do, doing the development work. So if we were to do that, yeah, I mean, I don't know, it wouldn't be the shape of the company, it wouldn't be the face of the company, how we operate. So, um, uh, but, you know, there would be other companies that would continue, there's a, there's a lot of momentum behind the Swift project, and I, I would hope we would be missed, um, uh, but I wouldn't. It would look. I mean, to do the development in, in the project, we're we're taking we're taking customer requirements and we're folding that in. And as long as we're continuing to do that, then the project's going to move forward. And uh, to to extend on that, if we were to stop, if if you were to stop, maybe there's other companies because Swift as a project has been around for longer. Trove yeah. as a project hasn't reached that momentum point. So if today, if we were to take our foot out the gas, take our ball and go home, yeah. then the number of the sheer number of commits, or if you look at a number of engineers dedicated to working on Trove, will drop by a factor of two thirds. That's not a good thing. I mean, I guess there is a symbiotic nature between uh, companies like ours that we have a component that is open source, but we have a component that is not open source, and the mm -hmm. community, right? And the community has certain fundamental uh, shortcomings in the sense of like, you know, putting things at scale or highly available. There's still a lot of gaps that have to be closed. And the reason why there's uh, these symbiotic contributions where we contribute upstream to help uh, the community to get better, but at the same time to plug the capabilities that we have that fulfill a need for the community right. in a better way. So yeah. if we would stop contributing, it would happen that maybe somebody else would uh, pick up the, the effort. That, that's a valid answer. But at the same time, what would happen is that our capabilities with the alignment of the community would start to grow apart. Mm -hmm. Now, if most of the business of at least the three companies in this panel are based on OpenStack being successful, definitely that would be bad because this misalignment or would take one of our companies away from the main part of OpenStack or would leave a hole in OpenStack. Yeah. All right, thank you. So uh, we've warmed up. Now we're going to spice things up a little bit. Um, so most of the questions actually were prepared by Tesora. So thank you. Not and me. I, wanna, I haven't seen the questions. Um, <laughs> so and, and it's not me throwing curveballs or anything like that. But uh, there was a question there, and I've purposely decided to kind of soften it a little bit. But the <laughs> question was: Are there any projects on OpenStack that need to be killed? Ooh. But uh, okay. uh, the uh, softened version of it is: uh, You know, do you see any projects? evolving as part of the OpenStack kind of umbrella set of projects that maybe should not be part of OpenStack? I mean, I have, I have an opinion, right? So actually, I would say no, right? Because um, I think that in order to have a thriving ecosystem, you have to have a place for projects to land. And yes, some are going to be successful. Some are going to get more mature. And others aren't going to be more mature and, and are going to fade to down to the lower whatever the lower right on on the maturity spectrum um, but that's okay and just because a project isn't successful doesn't mean that open snack shouldn't be a place for a project to come live and it's a 
Um, it, it's a great organization. Um, there's structure around how to contribute open source. There's, and we, we talk about, even in, our, in, in the Swift community, we have sub-projects within Swift. Some we feel should go in, some we feel th that we should stay out, but I think it's okay if smaller projects come in, even if they don't get broad adoption, just for the governance model, mm -hmm. just for the way that uh, code gets development in with an open stack. Let me take a controversial approach. <laughs> That's so, good. I mean, we are talking about a living thing, right? It's code, and code uh, becomes complicated, and it rotates, and at some point, it to be refactored. So the question is, what does it mean uh, a project uh, to have to be killed or not? If we talk about projects that are the, in the early stages of their life cycle, of course, people will say, oh, they are not mature. Maybe they should be excluded by OpenStack. But at the same time, if they are being created, it's because somebody uh, finds a value in them. So I guess what has to be is a maturity thing, like uh, the stats that were coming today in the, in the uh, keynotes, of saying uh, when a user deploys OpenStack, uh, when to know when to take the risk or not. Now, having said that, the question is like, why at some point we should not, uh, I don't know, refactor Neutron or refactor Nova or whatever it is. So the question is going to be, what's going to be OpenStack 10 years from now, five years from now? Because maybe somebody wants to write it in something that is not Python and maybe it's a language of the future. So we'll have to at some point revisit what is to be part of OpenStack. Is it the APIs? Is it the code? Is it the combination of the two? Is it the message bus? Should we have a scalable systems that solve some of the structural problems that we have in the community? So the question, I think, is it's much deeper, which is what's going to be the OpenStack definition a few years from now, and how do we find a way to rewrite things uh, when appropriate? Because otherwise, we will be stuck with a code that eventually is going to be too old to maintain or too big to, to see in the current structure. I, I think it's uh, similar to what you said. I think it's a self-selecting process. The, the code didn't just magically appear one day. Somebody had to write it. Obviously, that person felt it was useful for something. Um, I would, however, say that if there's a project which has gone dormant and has not received contributions in a while, changes of any kind, then it makes sense to kick it out the side. At this point, I don't know that there are any projects of that kind. But so long as a project is active and somebody is interested in contributing to it, it isn't really affecting the rest of the projects by the fact that it's there. It's adding some value to somebody. Let it be there. It's a self-selecting process. What I would like to kill is the explosion in the number of APIs which OpenStack is generating. There was a time when there was one compute API that was really good. Now we've got two, potentially three. What do projects, I'm speaking specifically for Trove, do? Is Trove supposed to understand three APIs for compute tomorrow? Or can we have one? Because the moment you start exploding the number of APIs, it becomes harder to consume the service even for an end user. So let's continue on this thread a little bit more. Um, and uh, my question is, in your opinion, um, should the um, OpenStack community drive the projects more towards kind of an opinionated implementation of a project? Or should it stay kind of at a higher level of abstractions and uh, kind of everybody should agree that OpenStack primarily is about the API consistency and you have to have a consistent set of APIs and then you can plug in a whole bunch of different things underneath. So in, in, in OpenStack, there's different kinds of projects, right? So for example, of Swift, Swift is a full implementation, right? You can plug in a whole bunch of things, yes, but you know you can just take OpenStack Swift and use it, and you know you don't need anything else, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at Nova or if you look at Neutron, um, you know there's varying degree of the implementation versus pluggability. So should OpenStack drive more towards maybe having a complete implementation of networking, complete implementation of block storage, complete implementation of object storage, or should it just be all APIs with different solutions that are pluggable? Yeah, and I'm hugely biased, right? Because yeah. of what you said, right? <laughs> and and I, I think it's great that someone can take a single project, get it up and running, have it solve their use case, and that's a great introduction to OpenStack. I think it simplifies things, and I think that can lead to more adoption of OpenStack if people can take a component and run it. I mean, why not have Neutron as a standalone thing, right, for example? Um, and, and so my, if and I'm- In fact, a lot of people do that, right? Yeah, so it's, it's sure. like 80% of the, probably 90% of OpenStack deploys, they just don't use any SDN plugins, just use Neutron. Exactly, so. exactly. So, you know, if I were to put the opinion slide, you know, all the way to, you know, to one side, it, it would be, let's have a full running implementation of, you know, specific projects. And if you want a database as a service, sure, just go 
fire up Trove, and there it is. There's that slice. Um, now, that's obviously a simplistic view of the world, and there needs to be a compromise in there. Um, but I think that's where I would stand, because I think that offers um, deployers more option and more choice and can lead to more adoption of OpenStack. I'd look at it from the, from the end user's perspective and say, for a person to want to just deploy Swift and have it solve a particular use case, there's a problem and it's solving it. Now, if there's a person who says, I need database as a service, don't drive me through this mud and grime of Keystone and Cinder and Swift and Glance and Nova and you know three other things which I didn't mention. Just give me the Trove appliance. I want database as a service. Make the rest of the stuff part of your appliance, for Christ's sakes. I want database as a service. You do all that stuff. We're actually working on something along those lines. My take is uh, it depends on the use case, right? OpenStack is trying to serve from things in service providers for network function virtualization to other things like IT clouds to other stuff. So the notion of an opinionated uh, implementation always comes with the premise that the person that had opinion understands the use case and tries to satisfy that use case. If the use case become diverse, now what we end up is with a mess because maybe you have two or three opinions that try to agree in the middle and the implementation doesn't satisfy neither of the three opinions that were there. So the other option is, okay, fine, let's create a modular implementation that you can plug in based on the specific use case that you have, something like a more secure networking solution than the default one, because this is for a, for a feather, federal government uh, organization versus a, a private cloud in, the, in a garage in your home. So that introduces complexity and testing and continuous integration and things like that. So the, the notion of having a default option in OpenStack where you can jumpstart a cloud, I think it's almost there. I mean, even with Neutron, you can do many things with compute nodes and networking nodes that may not scale or may not be completely uh, high performance, but it's good enough for most of the people. Um, should we focus on the areas that there are problems uh, in terms of based on the requirements of customers like high availability and scalability, that network is a fundamental component, have a better implementation? Maybe, and uh, now this, I would take it back to the use case saying, but now you have like service providers saying this should be the PDK versus Linux kernel versus something else. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we are humans and as humans, uh, choice is kind of uh, uh, fundamental and I think it's going to continue to be a driving force of OpenStack being a community where things come together rather than strong mandate by somebody saying that there has to be only one way. So if we, then take, Joe, your opinion, um, which is an interesting opinion, and in, in many ways I personally do agree with it. Uh, do you think that it makes sense for the OpenStack community to start just straight out forking some of the projects that are historically been used as plugins? Because, for example, if you just, I don't know, now there's a, you know, a whole ecosystem evolving around Magnum and a lot of stuff happening of Kubernetes, with Kubernetes' its own community, they have their own roadmap. So Magnum community might want to go somewhere else, right? Um, so if you want to really have a full implementation, ideally just go ahead and take Kubernetes and just fork it under the OpenStack umbrella. You can say the same thing for Ceph. You mm -hmm. can say the same, same thing for um, Neutron and, I don't know, uh, Open Contrail, for instance, and you can keep going. Um, is this something that would make sense or no? I think if you look at the Linux distributions in the past, um, what happened is that Linux kernel may be one, but then you have differentiation on what version of the kernel, what patches for security and resiliency, what user interface do you put, what packages do you fed. So here the, the distributions like Mirantis uh, and others, uh, there is an aspect of uh, self or natural selection on what it works. And what's going to happen is that, yes, somebody has to take this notion of putting all the pieces together and making it work. And if you call this forking it or customizing it or creating something that is supportable, it has to happen because you cannot just say everything that has been uh, upstream in OpenStack, you are going to take it as it is and, and support it. So the, the, uh, the distros is the place where things will kind of have to be supported and come to life. And in the same way as in the Linux desktop, they had a major role to make uh, Linux adopted in the OpenStack uh, world, it's going to be something similar. So I'd go in exactly the opposite direction because in that area, database as a service is different from the others. You may have, you may choose to have one plugin only in the others 
but typically a person who is using database as a service is using it because they're using more than one database. If a customer is only using one database, database as a service becomes less attractive to them. At least Trove becomes less attractive to them. And most customers and most complicated applications these days are polyglot persistent. You are going to have some data stored in a NoSQL data store, some data stored in a, uh, a relational data store. In some cases, multiple of each. Therefore, forking it and saying Trove have a Trove MySQL and Trove have a Trove something else becomes much less attractive because at the end of the day, one of the big value props for Trove is to say no matter what database you want, the API call to create is the exact same one. The API call to resize is the exact same one. So the fork will actually destroy that value prop. That's right. But the other side of a value prop that you could offer is you can say that here's a database as a service that works really well out of the box and covers 80% of the use cases for relational databases, but it's just this one thing. So we right. have so like if, if so, like so that's Amazon database service is just one right so it's not like they don't have multiple and oh, people and are using it no no Amazon RDS is multiple databases you have MySQL you have Postgres you have Oracle bring your own license you have SQL Server and then they have DynamoDB and then they have Redshift okay so okay. so they do have the same spectrum so in that regard storage and database are slightly different <laughs> but to your other yeah. point I'm going to make a shameless plug we have a product which will give you 100 percent of the databases and do really well with that. It's not OpenStack Trove, it's our DBAS platform. So that's the distinction, again, where we want to differentiate our product and say, you have a requirement for multiple databases, we've got a product which will address that. That's our differentiation. Okay, very good. So let's uh, switch gears maybe a little bit. Before I continue with my questions, anybody in the audience has any questions? Okay, there you go. Zero. I mean, it's always uh, good to be, for us it's more the certification of the different distros because customers care about how am I going to install, how am I going to upgrade, how do I know that uh, I'm not going to have conflicts between the OpenStack choice, uh, OpenStack distro of choice with the networking uh, choice, right? Especially because uh, networking is kind of glued to the whole thing. So for us, what we've seen more is like the question of, uh, do you work with this distribution rather than just the OpenStack uh, test? Yeah, to be a little bit less short. It's about supporting the applications mm -hmm. and the use case. And fundamentally, as a business, as a startup, someone who's building software, it's not about, no one's coming around going with a checklist of, do you support you know, all these things that the OpenStack Foundation says that should be in it? By the way, you know, it is, we do, right? Because it is the project itself. Um, but what they do run around and saying, do, they, do you solve my use case? Do you solve the problem that I'm having? Do, can you be deployed? Can I operate you? Right? Those are the questions that customers are asking. Right? So it's less about you know, how do we conform to some standard. Right? I, I know back in the day, IEEE or CINA or any of these standards, really what customers are caring about is can I go to them and solve their use case or their problem? And you know, to the extent that certifications matter, it's not about OpenStack certification, it's about the layer above, right? So, you know, getting certification with backup utilities and, you know, these other applications that people use, for example, those are way more important, you know, as we're building our business um, for, for users, for customers. Yeah, so we're in the same boat as your first answer, zero. Nobody cares about DevCore as far as Trove's concerned. What they do care about is, do you work with, pick a distribution. Do you work with Mirantis distribution? Do you work with Red Hat's distribution? Do you work with Canonical? Next question, do you support this database? Well, Trove has come a reasonable way, and we support a whole bunch of databases. Do you support MongoDB? Yes, we do. Do you support clustering in Cassandra? We support it in this release. Do you support Neo4j? Sorry, but if you pay us enough money, we'll make you do it. That's, so number of people who asked for a DEF core test, zip. OK. So this is another question. Um, can OpenStack ever catch up to AWS, and does it need to? Yeah, I was just add, I was going to add that suffix. As soon should as we it? started talking about well, yeah, okay. should it like really, okay. really, really like can is I mean, so people are choosing okay. you know public cloud versus you know private cloud for almost entirely different reasons, right? Not it's not about having you know mirroring the functionality that's in AWS. And by the way, we don't know what's pop popular in AWS. Only AWS knows that what's popular. Um, 
you know, there's maybe a ton of services that are complete bombs, but we have no idea. Um, but we do know which projects people are using in these private deployments, because we can see the projects that are underway, which ones get a lot of contribution, and which ones are moving ahead. So, I, I mean, yes, Amazon is a, absolutely a runaway freight train in terms of consumption of, 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 of infrastructure resources, but there's great reasons why people are doing on-premises, and they're making that choice almost independent of whether they're going to Amazon or not. So I don't even know, like, it, it, should we? I don't think the answer is, should be yes. So the answer is that we can't catch up, but it doesn't matter. Is it doesn't matter. Correctly? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't think, we, but I don't think, okay. I think catching up is the wrong question to ask. Because it's not about, oh, do we have Redshift in open, I mean, maybe we have something similar, but it, what people need in order to build the, the applications that they're doing in the Amazon ecosystem is not the type of things that people are necessarily doing on, for on-premises deployments. And the, the only way that we're going to be able to suss that out is by actually going into those environments where they need the on-premises infrastructure and then building up solutions for them based around that. They're not in Amazon for very good reasons, so let's capitalize on that. So, I, so I'd ask what you mean by catch up with Amazon. If you're asking in terms of total terabytes of storage, total core count, so on, absolutely. It's so, perfectly possible. Yeah, it's a good... It's a good uh, the, the next thing which I'd ask is if it's in terms of diversity of projects, absolutely, hey, we got more projects yeah, than they do. Fun. There's no question about that. Um, but is there one thing which OpenStack can do which Amazon has no chance at this point of catching up on? Yes. I have my data center in, I have my data in my data center. Amazon beat that. You can. Which maybe is not the right question, right? In the sense that Amazon is a service. Uh, when you take OpenStack, it's something that then you have to run by yourself. Now the question is, do you buy support? Do you train your people? And I would say the kind of the first comparison would be uh, when people move from VMware to cloud, do they create their clouds or do they go to Amazon? Because this is the kind of hard choice. Do I keep the existing business models at a lower cost or do I shift into a cloud consumption model? And probably both will be viable. And this is like, in any technology, we had desktops versus VDI. And there's going to be a combination of both, where a lot of people, for security reasons or data ownership, they are going to keep it locally, but they'll need something that is not as expensive as the current choice. And some people, for convenience, will just go to a public cloud because they may not have the expertise to run their own private clouds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of qualify my question. I think that the most important, yeah, the, I think ultimately, uh, um, to echo kind of, Joe's sentiment, again, I think that ultimately what people care is about the, it's, it's a whole user experience, right? It's not the features, it's not necessarily, a, um, you know, stability is definitely a big part of it, but what, what you care about is, you know, I, I have my applications, I want to be able to run them fairly easily on my infrastructure platform, um, and I want to kind of not have a big headache. That's mm -hmm. ultimately kind of the goal. So by catching up, that, that's what I meant. That, that was my kind of question. Um, here's another very concrete kind of way to, to ask the same question, maybe we'll kind of repeat. So um, there's rumor on the street that Amazon's going to launch a private cloud in the box service. You just have like a container of AWS that they just ship and they just put it in your data center. You have everything that AWS has just as stable and they just remotely operate it for you, but it's right there and you can burst to their public cloud. Is OpenStack dead then? They've been saying this for a long time. Yeah. Okay, um, but once they do it, what yeah, happens? Okay, yeah. So, okay, so, okay, now you're putting all your stuff <laughs> inside of AWS. And, all right, you go talk to the IT folks that we were all talking to at this conference. You, the the lock-in is just incredible. Yeah. Like, especially with moving the data, da like you mentioned moving data around, that's, they're going to have your data, and now you're building your applications tied to that infrastructure suddenly becomes this operating system and you have no other place to go. And I, I don't, I think that we have to, as an industry, kind of draw a line and say, look, no, we aren't just gonna go around and ha commit all of our applications to one company. I mean, that's why we're all here. I mean, we flew on a plane, if some of you are maybe locally in Japan, but we flew here because we believe that um, 
there should be options and there should be an open infrastructure that people can deploy into. And I, I, don't, I just don't see everybody just moving down that because of, oh, well, it's convenient and they can park a shipping container in my parking lot. Um, I think there's a real belief that people don't want to be caught up in being locked into the same vendor um, because once that happens, they're going to have you for life and it's going to be hard to get out. They have you for life and they have your data and you don't necessarily know where it's going. Do you have a mic or a Linux yeah. machine? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it would be a very, very interesting situation because it will depend on the cost. If it's cheap enough and they manage it for you, a lot of people will go for it. And that's why yeah. OpenStack has to improve much more in terms of uh, the operational tools and how to understand how to troubleshoot the system. Because at the end of the day, from a financial point of view, if you have the cluster in your data center, it's easy to operate, it's cheaper, it would be a challenging thing for the industry. Now, is all the things that you said completely true? Absolutely, because then it's going to be much easier to migrate between the public Amazon and the private. It will never go to Azure or to Google, and you start to being locked. But uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting thing. If but really but isn't, your, isn't your implicit assumption it's a zero-sum game, that if they go to Amazon, they're not going to use OpenStack. If they use OpenStack, they're not going to use Amazon. We're talking to people who want to use hybrid cloud all the time. They want to pick up Trove and say, hey, Trove, can you provision an instance in Amazon AWS as well for us? So yes, you're going to get that shipping container. Some number of people are going to look at the cost and say, put the shipping container there. Doesn't mean they're not going to have OpenStack as well. They're still going to have Mirantis' distribution running right next to that shipping container. And your software and your software and ours, yeah. I hope so. Absolutely. So I, think I, 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 I can't, it's great to always have your colleagues do the uh, you know, evangelism on your behalf. I'm actually taking notes um, as a marketing guy to uh, um, help kind of propel the message. So uh, thank you for helping. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a question. You mentioned OpenStack uh, for private cloud and talked about public cloud being Azure or, or Amazon. Do you not see that OpenStack can be successful as a public cloud? Oh my gosh, no, absolutely, absolutely yeah. right? And that's part of the choice that, that, that is out there. I mean, uh, you know, folks like NRIT here in the audience, they, they run a public cloud based on OpenStack, and that gives, that gives cloud providers that option too. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's just private. I think from a, if you're talking to someone like, uh, like, like us, our, um, we're, we're focused on uh, more on private because there's more type of enterprise customers. And yeah, there's going to be a certain segment of our customers. To us, it's a single customer. It's a, they're running on-premises for them, but they just happen to be offering that as a public service. Um, but I think that's more the, the mindset of someone in our shoes uh, building software and selling software to, to companies. See, uh, the other, other half of that is interesting, right? Because with OpenStack, you have the option of managed private cloud. So okay, just a time check. So yeah. last comment. So, so managed private cloud is something which is already there. Effectively, by putting the shipping container in your, in your data center, Amazon saying, hey, we want to get into the managed private cloud. But the number of people deploying managed private cloud with OpenStack is staggering. Um, so that's, that's a good thing for, for OpenStack. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I think that there's, uh, we're done on time, right? I think. I, I don't okay. know. I, th I think, I think we're, there's people piling in there. So yeah. Thank, thank you. you. debated more about it's the Amazon comparison. It's what's in between the VMware comparison. And what I would like to say is that the
Hello. There we go. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> if you want, you want to change it, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, let's do that. So. What's the start? Is it time? Got a minute? Okay. There you go, Mark. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll wait for the door to close. The uh, slides are at that bit way if you like to follow along or have a reference for later. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Atrocious spelling, I know. That's why that's why Mark put most of these together. That's I don't. <laughs> I speak JJ, I don't speak English. Sure. Hello, welcome. Hope you're having a great conference. Uh, hope you're here for the, uh, the what's cooking. This is a deployment and uh, with the chef and the OpenStack cookbooks. So I hope you're here to hear about that. Everybody can hear us all right? It's all good? Okay. We'll start off with some introductions. Hi, my name is JJ. I'm that guy. Uh, I'm a senior partner engineer at Chef. Um, I am the OpenStack Chef guy. Uh, anything Chef related and OpenStack related usually gets funneled through me at some point. Um, a technical resource. So my name is Mark Vanderweel. I'm from IBM. Uh, we started using Chef a few years ago when we uh, got involved with the OpenStack project. Um, they seem like a, a good pair to put together. Uh, so I've been working on the project for quite a while now and, and I'm one of the cores. So what is Chef? If you don't know, it's an uh, application to be able to provision and control your machines from a centralized repository. It's uh, infrastructure as code. Everyone know what Chef is? So I can just kind of, no, yes? <laughs> okay. Um, so as it says, uh, some of the simple concepts are it, it does item, it does, uses item potency and also uh, you have state-driven code to be able to make things happen. So you can say, yes, I would like to do uh, package Vim, and you run to the Chef client, and it installs Vim for you. Um, and it uses, as I said, infrastructure as code, where you can control things called cookbooks that are like, I'm going really off the topic here. Um, it's all good. So as you can read, uh, it automates and how applications are configured, deployed, managed across your network no matter the size. The advantage Chef has over a lot of other uh, configuration management systems is that the Chef client is run on the compute node instead of on a centralized server. So uh, you don't need to expand your master of puppets, if you will, to be able to uh, take a blob back and forth on the machine. So I'll get into um, what do you get uh, with the current, where we're at with this project. Uh, this is part of the big tent. Everybody knows the big tent, right? It's the core projects and everything outside the core projects is part of the big tent. Uh, the OpenStack Chef cookbooks are in the big tent. 
So you can take a look at them. We're, we participate in the community like everything else. So what do you get with it? The, the, the thing that um, with this project that was key to making it whole was, of course, coverage of at least those core projects in OpenStack, Nova, Glance, Cinder, Keystone, all the rest of them, right? So having support for those, so you can lay down OpenStack with that type of deployment was the goal of this main start of this, of, of this project. The other part about this is, is keeping the overhead down on your nodes, right? So you don't want to have a lot of infrastructure on your nodes to be able to have to manage these nodes. So these nodes are managed via Chef, and it's Chef Client, is called. That's an agent that runs on the nodes. The biggest thing that I think that's most important, if you leave this room out of anything else, is to understand what distinguishes a lot of the Chef design concepts. I'm a designer. I'm a coder. Right? I, I keep designs in my head more than I keep you know, uh, ads in my head of uh, other things, is the, the, the idea of being state driven. Okay, this means you run something, right? You run it again, and you run it again. Uh, every time you run it, the state will be the same. It's hard for people to grasp that because most people don't code that way. That, that's not how code is written. That's not how scripts are written. Scripts are written, you run the script, it doesn't work. If I run it twice, oh, you can't run it twice without deleting this first. That kind of thing. All the backlash you have with running things more than once. The whole point of this is trying to be a, a state driven for your node management. And of course, the other thing about it is that um, the community has come a long ways with, with our cooperation with getting into the big tent as well as moving along with our testing. So we think we've done a pretty good job moving the unit tests in forward with these cookbooks so that they're relatively stable. And I, I can add to that also. Um, no, uh, Chef is Ruby. It's not um, Puppet. Or, sorry, not Puppet. Yeah, not, not Python. That was Freudian. Um, so we have uh, TDD our test-driven development built in. Um, if you ever use any bit of Ruby at all, uh, one of the tenants of Ruby is test-driven development. So we have unit tests. And they are actually RB files, so you can run actual R spec, or what we call chef spec, which is a level on top of it, of R spec, to be able to verify that when a converge happens, uh, which is what a chef client does, you, it comes out as a state you, you expect to have. So you can have you can create a CDCI pipeline using the testing. So when you're moving through your, your changes, i.e. creating an OpenStack cluster, you can actually, before even running it on a physical box or a VM, you can verify that the thing will come out how you expect it to come out, which gives you confidence in your changes to production, because it'll catch early on in the pipeline. So the next thing is, is OK, why would you step up to this versus other types of deployment mechanisms? And the one, like you mentioned before, is, is the part of this infrastructure and being tested before you move it. The, the cookbooks have resiliency in them that, to drive, drive your state-driven deployment of your, of your OpenStack clusters. The other thing is that I think is one of these, it's, it's, it's a good and bad thing, and you'll see it later in the slides, is customization, right? This is a fully customized solution, right? You can extend it, beat on it, twist it, turn it, and it does have a, uh, the ability to be conformed to what you really want. And that leads to the last one, right, that it's... It's, it's customization, but it's, it's, it's beyond customization of what OpenStack wants, right? You can custom, customize it also with how Chef works. Chef allows itself to be easily expandable um, and wrapped, if you will, with other, uh, other solutions that can go with it. So it's not only customizing the, what you do in your cluster but, cluster, but also customizing your management solution. So that's things that some other things don't quite do that much for you. Talk about our community? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the strongest things Chef has is we have a, a huge community online to do to create what are called cookbooks that are literally re a collection of recipes to do something. Anything ranging from building an OpenStack cluster to installing Vim to controlling systemd uh, and everything between. Um, the, there's something called the supermarket, which is supermarket.chef.io, which is not on that slide, we should have put that there, um, which is a collection of places for cookbooks. So if you have your laptop in front of you, you'd probably want to check it out. Um, it's a great way to share cookbooks and have things out there. Um, so with the cookbook community, um, we have volunteers controlling the cookbooks and administering them. And there's a certain level of, you, you can have gradients of of uh, quality of cookbooks, but most of them are, that are out there, do what they say, which is amazing. Um, and it's all completely volunteer driven, so which is great. Oh, and yeah, we should say that too, because yeah. yeah, we are part of the big tent. We do get ATC. I have verified that. 
Um, so if you do commit to our cookbooks, which as part of the OpenStack community, um, you can go through the normal Garrett process and uh, you will get a, your ATC. So here's a slide that kind of tell you, you know, the nuts and bolts here about, you know, there are good things and there are bad things, strengths and weaknesses. So um, one of the strengths of, that I think is one of our most important goals we've been trying to focus on is being production ready, right? So we have the test cases behind to verify that, yeah, we can actually use this in a production environment. Um, speaking as an IBMer, we have used this in three products already. It's shipping, it's out the door, it's in the community. We've shipped it to hundreds of thousands of customers already, right? Underneath the covers, the customers don't even know that it's being used, the chef serving clients under the covers being used by our clients. Hundreds of thousands? A whole bunch of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, um, or of, of instances of, of oh, okay. there we go. That's right, yeah. That's the customers better. are there, yeah. <laughs> and then, like I mentioned before, for, in order for IBM to do that, we had to extend it with our own IBM wrappers because we have some things that we do slightly differently, but it, we, were, we were able to do that with these customizations with the wrappers. And of course, the platform dependencies was key for us, right, because we decided to use Red Hat for our, our enterprise solution for the platform of choice for the internals of our, of our products. And we were able to do that. These cookbooks support not only the Ubuntu and the Conical side, it also supports the Red Hat side. And which SUSE. Is, which is very important. And, and, and some SUSE is still in there. <laughs> SUSE, if you got SUSE expertise, we'd love to talk to you. Yes, we would. <laughs> and of course, you mentioned the supermarket cookbooks. Um, Third-party cookbooks are essential, right? So we don't develop the Apache cookbook. We don't install Apache. There's a cookbook that does it for us that, that's out in the community, right? We don't do some of the database, MySQL. There's a cookbook for MySQL. That's used by part of the OpenStack cookbooks to give you the total solution. And of course, like I said, the community strength, we've been doing a pretty good job, I think, becoming part of the Big Tent and moving our community forward. As for weaknesses, we still believe that our cookbooks are too complex for most folks. It takes them a while to bring them themselves up to speed to understand the concepts. Not that they're hard, it's just we have a lot of pieces in place. It's kind of like a puzzle. You can put it together. You will see the picture when you're done, but there are a lot of pieces. And um, can I interject something real fast? We have our PTL. We have a new PTL. Jan, come on up here. He wanted, to, you, he wanted to talk about the complexity and what we've decided to do for this next, um, uh, this next release. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, especially for these weaknesses, the complexity is, I think that's, that's one of the biggest problems. So. Um, as Mark and JJ already said, there, it's easy to um, add something like wrap cookbooks, add a lot of community cookbooks, um, add another layer to that via environments, roles, whatever. So you can really easily customize what you're doing there. And we did that for some years now, which in the end right now put us in a place where we really have a lot of layers where you can configure everything, but that max makes the whole thing very, very hard to understand. And although it basically has a lot of switch cases for all the platforms, you can deploy Red Hat and SUSE, and you can use MySQL and Postgres and DB2. You can do the no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you can do the 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 most the, the the craziest things with it, but it's hard to understand. And we want to really bring that down to being uh, to covering the most cases, like um, the most cases that, um, or this, this idea of covering 80% of the cases, but with 20% of the code. So really, really putting out all of that stuff that is not needed by most of the customers and moving that to somewhere else. We're still talking about that. We have more, uh, tomorrow we have a session where we will talk again about that. But we really want to make it easier to use these cookbooks and to yeah, throw out a lot of code. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, and, and the bottom one on there, of course, like you mentioned before, is this is Ruby code. So obviously, if you don't know Ruby, but for me, you know, I've coded in how many different languages, right? To pick up another language is not that big a deal. So if that's your stumbling block, then I think you've got other things to worry about. Um, the other part that I put in there is individual projects. The cookbooks is not one project. Like the rest of the cookbooks, there's Nova, and there's Nova. Um, no, for the cookbooks, there's a separate project for every corresponding project in OpenStack. So there's a Nova cookbook, and a Cinder cookbook, and so on. So that also t tends to lead to a little more confusion because there's, you have to manage more projects. Ah, uh, yes. So this one right here, I figured I would bring up pretty early on in the conversation because a lot of people wonder, so why not use Ansible? Um, why would you use Chef? Well, not only as a Chef employee, but as a, a community member of our, our community, I believe Chef is a, 
um, superior product for this, because if you've ever tried to do an if statement instead of a YAML file, I want to meet you and buy you a beer, because I haven't been able to figure it out. There, the, the way the tasks are run inside of Ansible and the playbooks that are run, it are very, it's the, how should I describe it? It's not item potent. You can't rerun it. You can't verify the machine is in the state you want it to be in. Chef, it's all built in. The chef, you can actually, as Mark was saying earlier, it's item potent. You can run the chef client as many times as you want to get the desired state. Ansible, you can't do that. Ansible, you run once, and then you hope that the uh, compute node pops up inside of uh, inside your cluster. To, con to continue on that flame war. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So why not Puppet? <laughs> Have you looked at the Puppet manifest recently? Um, so even Infra, as of this summit, is talking about using masterless Puppet or Puppet to do their deployments. So the major thing, it is literally called a puppet master where everything stays, right? And it's gotten so large for infra that they can't run it on a puppet master anymore because all the compute happens on the puppet master. Unlike Chef, which I said earlier, where the compute is actually done locally on the box that it's going to be told to do the thing. So it's a scaling problem. There, with Chef, you can do thousands and thousands of nodes, but there's a point in puppet where your puppet master will fall over. And then you have to build an infrastructure around your puppet master. All of a sudden, you have three or four boxes as a puppet master. The chef server is just, in essence, a S3 endpoint where it pulls down, makes sure the, it's in the state that it needs, and then con uh, converges everything locally. I'm sure we'll have questions on those two for you later. Oh, I bet so. So keep those in mind. So let me go into a little bit of the details of, of, of how this thing kind of works when you actually run it. So there's the, the notion of a chef server. Um, and the chef server, like I said, is basically an S3 point. It's basically your, your data point for all the information that the chef client would need, which would include cookbooks, things we call environments that describe your topology, things that um, the roles that describe what's within your topology. I have a database server, I have a compute server, I have a network server. And then you have data bags, or basically containers of, of low-level bits of information like how are you going to set up your user IDs and passwords? Are they going to be just floating around in the clear in some <laughs> script file somewhere? No. You want it to be under control somewhere and, and gathered together so you have all your essential information at the server level. The client is basically then just a user of that information to set up your, to move your client, your, your, your node, into the state you, you described up above. So if it's supposed to be a network client, it has a network role, it runs the network role with the recipes behind that, and boom, you get a network client. Underneath the covers, there are some other pieces that the Chef client uses, and one is OHI. OHI is, is, is another really cool thing I think, that distinguishes Chef and how we do things different than other folks is that it discovers the basic information about your node. Where other, I see other clients, they have to go out there and do this manually or have other scripts to do it. it OHI will know some of the basic information about the node, the IP address, how much memory it has, how many CPUs it has. All these little pieces of good information are pulled right automatically into your Chef client infrastructure. So it's kind of nice to have it there because then you can base your recipes off of that. And I'll talk one more here, and then I'll turn it back to uh, JJ yeah. on the other one. So we basically have this, this, this is the projects that are out there today. So we have something called the Chef Repo. It's our gathering point to bring all the cookbooks together. Like I mentioned, we have separate projects. Those projects are called Cookbook, OpenStack, Common is a common one that we have to kind of put some common code together. And then Cookbook, OpenStack, Nova, Compute, or whatever the rest of it might be. These are specific to those particular ones. And then, of course, we have some other cookbooks we, we, we bring in. Um, we have some wrapper cookbooks just in our own implementation to wrap around the database or wrap around the messaging server. Because we don't know what messaging server you might want to have. Do you want Rabbit or do you want something else? The database, do you want MySQL? Do you want Postgres? What, what do you want? We don't want to hard code that in our cookbooks anywhere, so we've, we've wrappered the community cookbooks that support those with our own wrapper cookbook. So you can kind of see this hierarchical thing starting to form in your head, right? We have the repo, we have all the project cookbooks, and then we have some specific cookbooks that wrap even community cookbooks. So it's quite the scheme of how, how this works, but it comes together with the repo. So the uh, OpenStack Chef repo is the thing that if you have any interest at all in this, this is where I'd probably like you to start. Um, this is it's an all-in-one blob of the data you need to build an OpenStack cluster on your laptop. So if you have a, ideally 16 gigs, but you can get away with eight, um, 
Vagrant and VirtualBox, you can actually, we have rake tasks and documentation on how to build the, with using the community cookbooks on your local machine, a OpenStack cluster. Uh, it can be all in one or it can be multi node. So you can have multiple compute, um, compute nodes after it with a controller with the network node inside of it. Even has new, it has Neutron support also. It's, uh, if you in essence, it's Chef Stack, right? It's Dev Stack running with Chef. And it uses, uh, right now, the packaging from upstream. Mm -hmm. We haven't done it from source yet, but it is, uh, we are thinking about going down that path. Um, the second bullet point is also important. Uh, basically, there's a lot of people out there who want to just have an all-in-one build or they have an extra desktop sitting beside their, their computer or they've or, uh, depreciated value in their desktop and they're getting a new one, but they still have 16 gigs. Well, we have documentation called all-in-one bare metal.md uh, inside the Chef repo that will actually teach you from absolutely nothing to having an all-in-one build of Kilo right now Kilo. Um, from the ground up. So you can add, it even teaches you how to use Hosted Chef and all the major um, portions of the Chef ecosystem. So you can actually see it. We're planning on adding uh, multi-compute to it also. So you can horizontally scale out with multiple compute nodes. And then also um, off of that, I'm planning on writing some documentation on how to teach you how to use the uh, cookbook uh, test kitchen, which is a part of the Chef ecosystem with that compute, uh, with that OpenStack cloud that you build. So some nuts and bolts here about how, how this kind of works. So the first thing is, well, if you're a developer and you want to get started, what do you want to do? The first thing, right, check out the Chef repo. That project is the umbrella project that brings all this together. What do you need on, on your laptop to get this thing going? The cool thing about this, what I think is another thing that, you know, I can debate Python, Ruby, you can do that all night, that's fine. I'll, I'll have beers with you if you want to talk about it. I think it's great, it's a great conversation. There is this great new thing that they came up with at Chef that's called the Chef DK. It's a development kit that encompasses more than just Chef stuff, right? It puts Ruby inside there and some other tools inside there. So basically, after you install the DK, you've got all the things you need. You don't have to go searching around and try to figure out what other packages you might need to install. They're, they're right there. And, okay. and in Ruby, they call them gems, by the way. Can I, can I just jump in real quick? Yep. Um, and with the Chef DK, it actually, for instance, on a Mac or a Windows, or sorry, Mac or a Linux box, it installs it under Opt, so it doesn't mess with your system Ruby. It has its own embedded yes. version of Ruby and everything, so it's its own entity. So you don't have to worry about dealing with gem files you may have heard back in the day of, of Chef or whatever. It's all self-contained. Right. So that, that, that's a big key. You can start it right now, and it's not going to you know, blow up your laptop and like that. It's pretty straightforward stuff. And then, of course, I mentioned like uh, you know, Linux, Windows, Mac is all there for this to, to get your development started, whatever you choose. The other part that we've been working on really hard in the last couple of releases is testing. Um, testing is done with make files. This is a Ruby make file that runs. Um, we have our standard tests like almost all the other projects have, some type of a lint test style test. And, and of course, we're working really hard to get unit tests to be fully complete. We've got quite a bit of Sorry. unit test coverage right now. The big thing we've added lately is integration testing, right? So we're actually, you know, you know, eating our own dog food here, right? We're, we're making sure and that we, when we run the test, it's running against the actual, the actual stack that we put up there, we call Chef Stack. So what we're doing there is we're actually staying up our own all-in-one inside, inside infra as a gate, and then checking to make the, the basic things work with Tempest, things like that, run, run some basic tests, make sure things are up and running. So that, that's, that's been a big thing, and it's kind of cool that now we're actually where we got gates that are running like the other, like the other folks in, in infra, you'll see everybody else is running dev stack to set up their, their, their open stack and then running tests against that. Well, that obviously defeats the purpose of using Chef to do this. So we're setting up our own stack in the gates, but Chef stack. Mm -hmm. So that's clear, but that's what we're doing. And that, that, and that was a big leap forward, so we're taking care of making sure that when things change, we're testing it, as, at least for the first part, for the all-in-one. Uh, just to continue on with that, uh, we did this just recently over this last cycle. Um, we started this in Vancouver, and we were joking about it um, at Vancouver, saying, oh, this is probably going to take us a whole cycle to do it. But as soon as we sat down with the Infra team, we discovered that um, it was literally just us hooking some things up, and all of a sudden we're able to build um, everything we can, everything we want locally. And this is important because any change that you put into the cookbooks, any attribute change, anything you do, we have a non-voting job that makes sure everything it verifies. And then we even, as we say, run Tempest after it. So we actually verify that the machine that we, the, the OpenStack Cloud you just built and made the changes for, Tempest passes. 
granted we need a better better tempest tests but right. we'll we'll have that sales pitch in a little bit <laughs> so there's there's some other related products that JD is the owner of, so he'll let you know about those real quick. Yep, uh, so we have, these are the three main integrations um, from the Chef ecosystem into OpenStack. So instead of the builders of OpenStack, consumers of OpenStack, um, we have a knife plugin, which is Knife OpenStack, um, which basically is the major, I want to spin up a machine inside of, uh, inside of open, my OpenStack cloud. We have Kitchen OpenStack, which allows you to use uh, the Kitchen Driver, which Test Kitchen is the integration testing framework for Chef to be able to spin up multiple machines or one machine inside of uh, your OpenStack cluster or cloud to make sure that it shows up how you expect it to. And then we have Chef Provisioning Fog, which is um, a, a little bit more, it's a, it's a resource to be able to declare clusters and multiple machines inside of your OpenStack cloud. So if you want to spin up three machines and make sure that three machines are always there, you can write uh, using Chef Provisioning Fog to make sure it shows up how it does. If you haven't seen Chef Provisioning, check it out. It's pretty cool. It is. So just some references here that, you know, like the other projects, we have a wiki that we've been trying to update and keep the documentation there for the basic development, how to get started, how to contribute, how to help out. We have meetings. Of course, there is right there. We have an IRC channel. Come and talk to us. And of course, we are on Launchpad like the rest of the projects. All of the projects underneath I mentioned before, the repo, all the specific cookbooks, are all underneath one Launchpad group called OpenStack-Chef. Mm -hmm. So now we'd like to um, I'll leave time here so you guys can ask your questions about where we're at and, and where we're going. We'd like to have a conversation because, you know, I, there's a lot of people out there that believe that Chef is extremely complex and uh, challenging to use. And we like to have an open discussion about it, see what we can do better, or maybe stumbling blocks or anything. Anything? Paolo, I'm looking at you, buddy. <laughs> no, go ahead, Matt. <coughs> Uh, what is the coverage for the various OpenStack projects? I mean, do you have Heat, Murano, all those other things? Great. That's actually a great question. We probably should have put that in the slide. Uh, so we have all the main core projects. And um, the, this release, I'm planning on getting Magnum and, uh, was it Manila, I decided? Or was it something else? I think it was Manila. Manila. Um, those two projects, but all the core main projects you can totally build off the ground. Um, and that includes heat. And heat. heat yep. was, it's not part of the circle they showed on their maps. Now they <laughs> moved, they moved, heat moved outside, but heat yeah. is already there. Orchestration is there. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, ironic, bare metal is there. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> so we have those there. Um, and we also have some Docker integrations parts there too. Yep. So there's, those other pieces are, are already there. Um, and then there's starts for cookbooks for both Trove and Sahara. They're started but they're definitely not complete yet. So that's, if you're really interested in those, let us know. We can, we can help you work on them. I don't think it would take that much to flush those out. It's just that has not been our priority at the moment. Yep. We, we are trying to make, the, the priority has been, or the priority as Jan was saying during this next cycle is to make this more accessible to more people. Um, we acknowledge that these things are complex um, and we are trying to make it more accessible to more people so they can just build an OpenStack cloud how they would like to build. There was a question back here. Uh, sorry, I joined a little bit later, but uh, we we are using in my company, I'm working for uh, German Telecom. Mm -hmm. We are using a lot uh, Chef, and the main problem we have uh, is how to package the cookbooks, how to uh, manage the life cycle of the cookbooks to, to get them through a development, to a QA, pre-production, production environment, and to guarantee that the cookbooks that were used in one phase, they are the same in the mm -hmm. next phase. How do you manage this? So there's a handful of different ways. Um, off the top of my head, there's just simple uh, version and pinning to make sure you're adamant about your version, ver version pinning. Uh, there's also policy files, um, which is another option, which we, are not, we don't fully support inside of the OpenStack Chef project, but I, I can take that conversation offline with you. Um, but in the, when it comes to OpenStack Chef, the version pinning is how we do our things. Um, master right now, we don't version because we're constantly moving it forward. But as soon as we uh, stamp something as stable, kilo, stable, whatever, um, then we start, we have a very strict uh, sumver policy 
that we've actually put inside our wiki to, 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 start, to, to tell you to make sure that you get exactly what you expect to have. So we, we take version pinning, pinning quite seriously. Yeah, for the, for the IBM project that we worked on, uh, we did it a couple different ways, but the main way we had it is we basically had our own copy of the repo and we had our own locking mechanism there to lock to the commit levels um, in addition to just the, the version levels of each cookbook um, for every branch of the product. Um, yes, that means you have quite a bit of branching going on, but none of those branches, though, were, were forks. They were just branches pointing to something in the community. So that was the key, is that we weren't forking anything. We were just keeping track of, okay, we shipped out a patch and it used that set of cookbooks and we could track it that way. And then on the internal side, we could use that as a tracking mechanism, right, to fuller understand when, when, when something goes wrong, people can bring down the exact set of code again and, and, and take care of business. If you want to know more about that, I can, I can talk to you offline about that too. So. Okay, uh, one of the traditional drawbacks used to be the complexity of installing the workstation in addition to the server and, and, and bootstrapping the nodes. So what's the difference between the old Chef binary, the old workstation package, and the new Chef DK one? What exactly does it sure. make simpler? Absolutely. Um, so the Chef DK is, if you actually go to the old workstation wiki page, which believe it or not is still out there, which we need to fix, um, the Chef DK is everything you need in that workstation as one binary. So it has all the testing, all the Ruby, everything locally there that you need. So the workstation in essence is just a install of that. Um, it makes life much easier and uh, allows you to get everything you need to go off, get, get off the ground as quickly as possible. The, the key management can be answered in two different ways. Uh, if you're running off of hosted, there's actually a getting started button now that gives you all your key management you need and even re re creates a validation key for you. Um, but if you're doing local or doing a um, uh, on-premise chef server, uh, you'd actually use the same process because hosted and the on-premise server are the same thing now. Yeah, just to iterate too that uh, what happens during our integration test, right, is uh, integration <laughs> step one, load and, and install chef DK. Step two, Run the run the test. I mean, that's that's all that's all it is. There's no we don't have to worry about whatever else is on the machine. Just run Chef DK install, and then we start running our test. That's as simple as it is. So it's, it's it makes it very nice. Though that's right. Yes, uh, and then twelve one of uh, Chef, you don't need a validator pen because it uses the user user a uh, username to validate against it now. And, and you can see some examples in our repo about how we put together some of the, the, the data bags and, and, and how we're using the keys just in there. Uh, it's, it's a way to get started, so. Uh, they, they all in one build, um, all in one uh, bare metal build that is inside the Chef repo. I, I, would, I, I challenge everyone to go take a look at it and attempt to try it. Um, I've had multiple people go through it and be extremely successful with it. All you need is a desktop that ha or a machine that you're not using and you'll be able to build your own OpenStack cloud in about 45 minutes um, with all the configurations. And then as soon as you understand it all, you can actually blow it away, start over again, and you'll have it in less than 10. So less than 10 minutes, uh, you can have an OpenStack cloud running Kilo right now. We'll have Liberty soon. Um, we are very, we're, we're in the process of doing that to get it stamped. We're, we're gated by the, um, distributions Packages. and then the packaging. Packages. So that's why we're always trailing a little bit behind because we're not doing it from source, we're doing it from the packages. Right. But um, still, we, are, we try to stay as close to that as possible. But yes, I do challenge everyone to try to build, do the, the uh, AIO, AIO bare metal build. Other questions? <coughs> yeah, just start on the summary here then, if you have something, let us know. But the, basically what we're talking about here is that this is a project that is, has been growing and we're learning from our mistakes and we're growing. I think we're getting in a better way. I said uh, um, it grew in such an, in, in, in enough way that even you know, IBM picked it up and said, you know what, this is to the point where it can be used in production for a customer and we actually did that. And so it, it, yet there weren't, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it worked and it was, and it's, and it's been, it's been, it's been it, it, was, it was quite a good story, I think. Especially since, like I mentioned, is that um, a lot of folks I've seen there are forking the cookbooks internally. They want to mess with it and mess with it. And, and boy, I, I put my foot down really hard that says, in, in IBM, we are not going to, because we, that was our first attempt that the first team who started at IBM that went, did, did some of the chef stuff, they forked all the cookbooks and they were off in la la land, messing changes. And, and I'm like, well, what, what good is that if you haven't, you know, worked with the community on making it better? So I put a stop to that and, and it worked really well because now I became core to make it better. So I had to work my butt off to do it, but it was awesome. Yep. So, and that brings me to the growing community part, right? That we're always looking for feedback, good or bad. 
on the cookbooks. Any solutions or any questions you have, we'd like to, it, a, a challenge is always good for me. And like I said, I think we have a pretty good future, uh, you know, as, as, as Jan, our, our new, you know, great PTL we got going here, you know, we are going to try to address the complexity issue with how the cookbooks work. That shouldn't scare you away. I mean, complexity is the thing we see with a lot of things. Um, but I think, and, and I think you will see an, an evolution happen with how we address these things in the cookbooks. We're going to take a different approach to how we look at the cookbooks in terms of trying to solve a, uh, a configuration for everybody. Try to sign it, try to make a configuration for the 80% of the users, and then other folks can add on what they want as, as they need. But don't let that complexity drive the main, the main branch. And that's been tough because the history of these cookbooks came from a spot where they were trying to solve everything for everybody almost. So. TB2 support. And then, yeah, that's, that's my bed, sorry. That's, I'll take that right on the chest there. That's DB2. If you're a DB2 guy, let me know. I'd like to talk to you. Um, but no, DB2 is not part of the issue anymore. It, it's magically going to disappear from this particular project. Uh, and, and just to parrot what, what Mark is saying, um, we, we are looking for more people to be involved. Um, our community is agile. We're, the advantage of being small right now is that we have a core group of people supporting this, and we, we like working together and pairing and making things happen. We just, we would like more people to in, 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 be involved. And also, feedback. We desperately, desperately need more feedback. Um, we know we're doing, we know we're building stuff. We know people are using it. People just aren't telling you that it's, it's broken or telling you that it's successful. We need, we need any type of feedback. Uh, we are on the official mailing list. Yep. Um, we have bug reports and um, I mean, my job is to, you know, make sure that the stuff is, and I'm the OpenStack chef guy, right? I am supposed to help make it forward. And with Jan now taking the PTL, we can, you know, move, move things forward. And I guarantee if you put up a patch, I'll be the first one to negative one it. It's true. This I'll guy, he, he's the brutal. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that should thrill you, right? Because you're going to get that <laughs> feedback. I'm pretty good at the giving negative ones out right away just to introduce you to the community <laughs> and say, great job, and fix that typo. And, Maybe I spelled it wrong. So it's all good, right, to get your get the blood flowing. He, he's legitimately made me uh, abandon multiple patches because I just couldn't do it. <laughs> Sorry, I have uh, one more question. You, dis you said that you use it in production yeah. right now. Uh, are you handling the hardening of the hypervisors with the chef cookbooks? There's the system, system level yeah. hardening. Yeah, probably I can answer that, um, especially for the telecom, because we have also yeah. worked Carrier with... Carrier grade. Yeah, yeah, we have also done that. Um, the telecom laboratories, actually, in Germany especially, yeah, exactly. have done a lot of cookbooks, and we are using, actually, um, the official OpenStack cookbooks with these hardening cookbooks. So you... Works perfectly. You are using the hardening... Yeah, we just... Dot just .io from telecom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's basically just another layer... Wrapping everything, including the hardening, works perfectly. As a lot of people have said, um, and the, the, the only feedback, and I know this, this, uh, this sounds weird to say out loud, but the only feedback I ever get about these cookbooks is, well, they just work. <laughs> and you think we'd be proud of that, but we know we can make this stuff better. Sure. And we want more feedback. And it just works doesn't help us make it better. Um, it works, that's great, but we need to know what we're missing. Um, the container story I know is huge. Everyone's starting to love containers, so we're starting to move in that direction. Uh, we have support for the Nova Docker driver. Right. Um, but with Magnum, um, that's my, my personal goal, is by the time we get to Austin, I'll have a Magnum cookbook that um, I think our, our community can be proud of. And with that, thank you for coming. Appreciate yeah. your time. Have a great conference.